As already indicated, my name is Cornelius Odwal. I work at the Kenya Human Rights Commission as the Deputy Executive Director. The Kenya Human Rights Commission hosts the Limu Bora Working Group, which is an initiative of civil society organizations working to champion for an education system that conforms with international principles of quality, inclusive, accessible, affordable, and equitable education system. As you already know, uh, and judging by the number of participants who have joined, and I know most of them are young people, Kenya has walked a long journey uh, with regard to our education reforms right from the time of the post-independence uh, period. And for those who are old enough, you can remember just after independence in 1964, we had the Omide Commission uh, that uh, sought to establish an education system that would foster national unity and create sufficient human capital for national development, uh, just in the wake of the huge challenges that were brought about by colonization. So that was the earliest uh, after independence our journey of reforms in the education sector. In 1976, uh, the Kenya Institute of Education was established through uh, the report of uh, Gadadi, and the Kenya Institute of Education has been around for quite some time, uh, guiding education matters in this country. So around 1981, we, there was also a, a shift in the education system uh, from what was uh, referred as a, a 7423 system. For those who are around uh, before 1984, people used to do class seven CPE and move to uh, form four. So the, uh, the, the CPE system. Later on, uh, we had the 844 system. After 1981, the 844 system took place and uh, the first cohort of people who sat for the 844 sat in 1985, the so-called KCPE. So KCP, uh, 844 has been with us for the longest period uh, until 2017, when uh, we also had a, a major shift towards the competence-based curriculum uh, that now uh, we are moving on. We are, we are really in very moving very fast uh, transitioning to this system of education that now places uh, two major components, uh, removing the class system to the grade, uh, from grade six to seven being the junior secondary school, going to the senior and then the tertiary level. So we must note that the intention of these reforms have been very progressive, uh, pro progressive especially uh, the la latest uh, shift has been seeking to curb a growing culture where cutthroat competition was the order of the day, oftentimes pushing parents and learning institutions into extreme lengths to stay at the top of the rank. Uh, we've been treated to annual celebrations of schools showcasing how they have managed to bring a uh, large number of students with over 400 marks and above. Uh, grade A has become the normal grade. Uh, so many of our schools are churning top level uh, grades at both high school and increasingly even in the, in the, in the, in the universities. So, uh, but we're asking ourselves with this increment in high performance, how does that translate? into the quality of people we are able to bring to the uh, labor market. But more importantly, why we are seated here today is the rushed manner uh, in which we've seen the transition from the 844 to the CBC uh, being done. And uh, the rushed implementation uh, seems to have done more harm than good uh, in the education sector, uh, creating a lot of 
confusion among parents and learners and has left us with so many questions that we've not been able to answer. We are asking ourselves today, are we using education as a political expediency at the expense of learners? Why? Why is the Ministry of Education moving very fast, even if we, people, stakeholders have raised critical issues and in, in, in a number of is, uh, concerns being raised about a lack of teachers, lack of equipment, but this thing has been pushed to, uh, through our throats in a manner that uh, we are really asking ourselves, who is the real beneficiary of this rushed uh, implementation? So as you see, sit here, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we know that education is a fundamental human right, and this has been captured very well in the Constitution of Kenya. If you read the whole Bill of Rights, Chapter 4, Economic and Social Rights, education is a fundamental human right. It's central for the exercise. It's central for the exercise of other rights and the single most powerful tool that lifts socially excluded human, human beings from poverty into a more dignified uh, lives in the society. So it's for this reason that uh, a Limubora uh, working group was established as a civil society led initiative to consolidate the voice of citizens and more importantly, ordinary Kenyans in the ongoing discussion around education reforms. So we sit here today to deliberate and to seek your input as a critical stakeholder in education matters on how we can collectively as citizens and the general public push for meaningful education reforms. Ultimately, we'll be very happy if collectively we are able to realize quality, inclusiveness, accessibility, affordability, and equity, equity in education uh, sector. So I know that through the partnership of CRECO, who have helped us to organize this website, we've worked closely with almost 50 volunteers from uh, the 47 counties to identify and mobilize uh, uh, the public in our respective counties. We know that we are going under a very difficult time. At some point, we were worried whether this webinar was going to take place in light of what is going on. But we strongly feel that amidst all this confusion uh, with Mandamanos, education remains an important subject and we must be able to deal with it at the right time. So with those few remarks, I want to sincerely thank Reco. Uh, the Elimubora Working Group through the uh, reporting panel, which is the technical uh, unit within the Elimubora Working Group, guiding us in our advocacy work. And equally important, Uraia, for providing financial support uh, towards this uh, webinar. So with those few remarks, thank you very much, and I wish you a very fruitful discussion moving forward. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you so much, uh, Cornelius. Um, and um, those remarks uh, create um, uh, a climate setting of what we are going to discuss. And uh, thank you also for the partnership and also the remarks that you've made in terms of appreciating our mobilizers. Uh, without their effort, we would not be having uh, all these participants from all of our country. Um, Dr. Sheila Wamahiu said that education without values, like science without ethics, is dangerous and destructive and not sustainable. Education plays a critical role in the realization of sustainable development, both at the individual and societal levels. Education is not about passing exams. One of the targets of education is to have people with knowledge, skills, and attitudes that are needed to promote sustainable development, sustainable lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, 
promotion of a culture of peace and non-violence, global citizenship, and appreciation of diversity. That is why when you are trained as a doctor here in Kenya, you can practice anywhere in the world. When you are trained as an engineer here in Kenya, you can do engineering designs that are applicable all over the world. Therefore, governments all over the world, including Kenya, should ensure that education system and curriculum facilities or facilitates development of holistic individuals with relevant knowledge, skills, and attitudes that will enable them to meet the demand and challenges of the 21st century. Education is a continuous process that begins when a person becomes conscious of himself or herself and the environment around them. So this means that education starts from home uh, with the parents being the first teachers with whom children interact. Education has been regarded as a defined investment that continues to eternal life, meaning that one should leave a legacy of their knowledge. And at this juncture, I would like to uh, welcome Mr. Boas Waruku, who is an education expert, as well as also an advisor with the Limubora uh, Network. He's going to give us a keynote address on the importance of Limubora, minimum standards and principles of education as suitable for Kenya in the ever changing uh, world of the 21st century and beyond. Mr. Waruku has been a director with the Civil Society Fund in Africa. He's an education expert and currently advising the Elimubora Network. And we can proudly say that he's a former chairperson of the Constitution and Reform Education Consortium and the Uraia Trust. And uh, with that introduction, you're most welcome for us to make your presentation. Uh, thank you, Joshua. Um... I'm Jambo wa Kenya Wenzangu. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, we are being heard well. Uh, thank you. Just before we start, uh, Joshua, uh, you've said so many things, but very important ones uh, touch on education. And because we are here as citizens of this great republic, Kenya, uh, we need to then situate our conversation today in context. First, I would like us to uh, just observe a minute of silence uh, in honor of those who have lost their lives, including children who should have been in school. Um, and then now we can proceed, just a minute of silence. Thank you. Having said that, I think I also wanted us to be very clear because uh, uh, the situation Kenya finds itself in is, uh, is, is, is not a, an easy one. Uh, in fact, we are saying education is under attack. We are saying that uh, teachers, students and the school infrastructure are under attack and we are saying we are losing a lot of time. Unfortunately, this can never be recovered. So as we are uh, opening ourselves up to do this conversation, I would like to appeal to all of us, first and foremost, to realize that when we are discussing education, it touches the core of the issues that are really bedeviling our country currently. And indeed, uh, we should be discussing them with very objective mindset without bias to any political persuasion. Why? Because it is important that when we discuss education, we extricate ourselves from the vagaries of the uh, uh, politics of the day and politics of yesteryears and only look at what is best for our children and best of for our education system. Having said that, uh, I come from the background that uh, Kenya, in uh, our understanding, is a country that has been struggling like any other country uh, uh, that was colonized uh, by the colonialists uh, to uh, evolve a system of education that they would be very proud of. 
I'm saying that uh, based on the kind of attempts that we have seen before, where uh, almost uh, periodically, we, not more than uh, within five years or less, we have been seeing that uh, every attempt has been made to address certain challenges that we face uh, in Kenya concerning education. And indeed, when uh, Cornelius did uh, give his comments, he did cite uh, some of the attempts through commissions that had been made to ensure that we do have a better uh, education system. But we, we realized that uh, a lot of these attempts have been uh, fully controlled by the colonial powers and neo-colonial forces. Uh, Having said that, it means that for us really to be able to address education in its wholesomeness, education that matters, education that we desire, that we deserve, elimu bora, sio bora elimu, then we must go to the crux of the matter. And elimu bora working group uh, took time right from the beginning of this year in January to consult widely and also internally within the member organizations to look at what really is ailing education system in Kenya today. And uh, based on that, um, we uh, set up, uh, sorry, I think uh, some of these calls may not be very helpful. So. Uh, based on that, the, um, the education, we, we realize that there are lots of challenges that we are facing. And some of these challenges are not new you would realize that uh, the challenges we are facing today have actually been, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, used prophesied uh, by the previous uh, commissions. Uh, they have been prophesied by serious scholars who have been uh, doing research in education sector and all. And what has been happening is that our inability actually to translate key recommendations that many of those um, uh, commissions do recommend is partly why we are where we are today. For example, I know that uh, one thing which Kenyans uh, do not want to address and uh, really get back to, look at the COEH report uh, of uh, 1999. That, uh, that one was the, the one that recommended uh, the uh, totally integrated uh, it was ticket, totally integrated quality education, yes. And the key recommendations that needed to have been implemented uh, to uh, ensure that the 844 education system, as was then, would be uh, strengthened and would be reformed in a way that uh, uh, we would not be having the many problem, problems or myriad of problems that we were uh, facing then that we realize instead of us having a serious look at those recommendations, I think we glossed over them. Not many of them were implemented. Uh, we've, we realized that uh, even the attempt that uh, the Professor Douglas Odiambo uh, tried uh, to uh, bring to the fore, uh, that is of the 2012 uh, task force, uh, they, they made several, uh, I mean, uh, uh, observations, indicting actually uh, as a total indictment of the 844 system and made certain recommendations on how they could be addressed, but to be addressed holistically, participatorily with all the stakeholders on board. Unfortunately, I think uh, we've used uh, in various ways, we've used the Professor Douglas of the Ambo report uh, to indicate that that is where the springboard of the competency based education uh, came uh, came about. Unfortunately, you look at uh, how the CBC then is coming into play, you realize that uh, they have not even followed the path that uh, Professor Douglas of the Ambo report had uh, uh, more or less talked about. For example, the issue of financing, which actually is also at the core at the failure of our education system to serve the interests of the public and to service the core 
uh, sectors of our society, including starting with those who have been marginalized so much in the past based on geography, based on abilities or disability, and based on other factors, uh, in, including income uh, and social status. Some of those uh, issues uh, which were supposed to be addressed through a model of financing that would be helpful to us. We are seeing that, for example, in the CBC uh, from framework and moving it forward, uh, they are more or less uh, taking us backward. Why do I say so? One, the CBC in itself has become so expensive. It has loaded the parents with a lot of uh, requirements that almost each and every day they are looking for extra money just to make sure that they uh, finance what is required. I mean, how many parents do you meet with at the bucket places begging for just a, a camera or a, a phone with a camera just to take some photos of something and take? It it is really not helped us in the form the the form that we have taken on implementation of the cbc it has not helped us to come to reality with the element of financing that was supposed to have helped us uh, being being addressed secondly it has also not helped us uh, critically to look at the basic foundation of our education and we say uh, among these other things we've been saying education for what? Uh, education and, and why education in the first place? Yeah, The philosophical foundation of our education, which we are saying that uh, Kenya has been very well blessed because we know that our foundation is on human rights, education as a right. We have included that in our constitution. Uh, Article 43 of the Constitution. They are talking of uh, basic education, I mean, I mean the right to education uh, as a fundamental right. And uh, if you looked at uh, the article dealing with their children, Article 53, it actually unequivocally state that uh, basic education shall be free and compulsory. What is lacking there is in terms of declaring and making sure that when we talk about a free basic education, what do we mean? What does free mean? What does free mean? And indeed, Kenya is also a signatory to various international instruments. Among them, we can look at the ancient declaration, the very latest, that is the framework that is guiding the sustainable, uh, guiding us towards achieving the sustainable development goal four by 2030. And if you look at that, the elements that are in there include the fact that education is a fundamental right that shall be provided by the state at the expense of the taxpayers, meaning that it is to be provided from the taxes that are collected by the government, but free of charge to the learners, and it is not to be a surcharge on the parents. You'll also realize that uh, when we move uh, from there, you, we, we, we find that um, our, our direction in terms of creating a clear philosophy around that, education being that public good, and education as a priority in this country that can help us to transform all sectors, all facets of life in Kenya. I think that is a clear omission that we really need to get back to. What we are experiencing are elements that still continue to perpetuate the inequality where education is only available for those who can afford. If you are talking of quality, in fact, many think that quality is not in public education sector. And a number of even our parents are nowadays very quick to take their children to anything called an academy. I'm not saying that people should not look for quality elsewhere, but I'm asking that for us to ensure that our children, regardless of where they come from, regardless of the status of income of their parents, regardless of the abilities that they are created with by their creator, that these are children who are able to access education of quality. Public education system must be transformed and to infuse quality 
and uh, 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 in a way that would un enable our own uh, children really to be very clear on why uh, they are doing so. And when we are looking at this kind of education, we should also be go going to the bottom line because I know people are always very quick to start looking at education in form of you finish your, uh, the, the various levels of education to the university and very quickly they tell you where is the job. So people are quick on the laptops everywhere just looking for jobs. And the way people look for jobs is like, we were passing people through schools and colleges and listing them somewhere for jobs. That brings us back to a, found, a foundational question that education in itself should be one that should enhance creativity. It should be one that should enable us really to be very productive. It is one that should be enabling us uh, to, uh, to, be, to remain functionally literate because education in itself is lifelong, you know. Uh, and in that case, when we are talking about helping our communities and our children to go to school, yes, it is good to tell them that you learn and by, by learning and performing very well and all that, you may get good jobs and all that, but you can also, we must also reorient our education system to enable it to be the one that creates jobs that the innovations that we witness, the one that would enable other, uh, 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 other persons really to be creative, that we are innovative, that we incubate the simplest of ideas that come across. For example, uh, in our schools, we get uh, engaged in the issues of uh, the Science Congress, uh, art and creativity and all that, but do we take time even to incubate some of those grand ideas that we see. Because when we incubate them and make them become uh, uh, innovations that can be done to industrial scale, that is how industrialization takes place. So education in itself is one that should help us to spur that growth and create the employment, not necessarily that is passing our children through some uh, a conveyor belt through schools, colleges and then on to some uh, space which is called the employment. Education in itself also should be the one that is helping us to deal decisively with segregation. I think I talked about the inequality already. So the segregation that we constantly have because um, I mean, look at the way uh, the planning system has, has worked in our urban areas. A majority of the population stay in informal settlements. Those informal settlements have not been planned for quite some time. For example, our government did not realize that in Kibra there were people living there when a majority of the uh, population in the informal settlements were in Kibra. And so the, the provision of uh, our education facilities were not there. And so we keep on asking, if you are not providing for that, then what kind of education are, pro are we providing? Education for who? So we must be very clear that we plan and provide education for our people, not for a, a privileged uh, elite class. And um, I think uh, in, on the basis of uh, that, uh, as Eli Mubora Working Group, we took time and said it is good that at least with the transition that was witnessed last year after the general election, there was uh, the declaration by the head of state that uh, uh, not just a declaration, a gazettement of a presidential working party, and that this working party was given six months to uh, do um, uh, conversations or consultations with Kenyans and indeed come up with a report that clearly uh, articulates the areas of challenges we are having in education and how we should implement our education uh, programs moving forward. On that basis, Elimu Bora said uh, for as long as uh, another working party, for as long as another task force, for as long as another commission is being formed, without a clear framework on what exactly are we looking at for such a transformed education system, then we'll simply be wasting resources. In fact, as we speak today, 
more than three or almost uh, 300 uh, days now. That working party has not even produced a report and as such we are wondering what exactly is happening there. But even as Kenyans anticipate that report to be produced and given to them so that they can read, not these uh, anecdotes, the small bits and pieces you're hearing the media uh, sharing here and there. I think that is meant to cause more confusion. But you're saying once that report is to come, as Limobora, we did formulate a framework that would enable Kenyans to look at that report and any other recommendations in changing the public education system in the country, that whatever it is, whatever recommendations that comes through, first it must clearly articulate a clear philosophy and vision for this country when it comes to education. It should actually, without reservation, but more concretely indicate that when it expresses itself, it is not just for the benefit of having it on good colored papers, but it will also be followed with clear implementation framework. But we are saying let that pronouncement not exclude the following. One, that education... Uh, boss, you, you have, uh, you have uh, five minutes, so uh, uh, you can summarize. Thank you. Uh, Okay, okay, ah, fine. So I, I, I would simply, I hope we also be providing a link to the minimum, uh, the, the framework for minimum standards and uh, principles of education that we have developed, because I think uh, it would also be helpful for our uh, listeners and the public generally to interact with it, so that when they'll be interrogating that uh, report, uh, the Professor Munavo report, when it comes, or any recommendations on improving education should they arise, then they'll be able to use this as a benchmark. We are not saying it is a marking scheme, but it is speaking to you on salient issues that you must look at. And uh, among other things, I think the issues of values, I like uh, when you already uh, made a contribution and talked about uh, 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 about the, the value system in that, but also the fact that through education system is the only way that I would tell you even our new, our good constitution 2010 can be implemented. And uh, you look at that, even what the uh, preamble of the constitution tells you, if you really want to be to recognize and support and protect that value of standing up for what is right, that you defend your country, justice and all, you'll realize that that can only start from a clear education system. That if you want to nurture our culture and bring cohesion and integration in this nation, it starts with education. That if you want to protect our environment, if you really want to ensure that the future generation inherit something from us which would be worth it, our own, in, our own heritage, you'll realize that that starts with education. And if you really want uh, to protect the families, if you want to protect our girls, our boys, our children with disability and our children from all corners, including those in very normal, in very unsafe areas, which has become the hallmark of their lives, then it must start with some good quality education. If you want to deal decisive blow to the misgovernance of this country, if you want to entrench accountability in this country, if you want to entrench integrity in this country, then you must actually start with education. And so you'll find that we have outlined a number of principles that would require that each and every Kenyan interrogates all these issues and deal with them. But whatever it is, let our education be holistic, be one that uh, enables the learner uh, to increase their, uh, their, 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 their creativity, that uh, you become more productive by going through an education system that we are looking at in Kenya. We are also saying uh, that uh, for all this to be packaged and implemented well, there must be clear standard standards, that of measure, that when we are talking about financing and accountability, we must be very clear what that means. How do we uh, arrive at even costing? How do we say 
what amount of resources would be adequate. I know that would be a subject that uh, Dr. Munyasi, my friend, uh, would be addressing. How also do you deal with issues of infrastructure? You've seen some of our children are still studying under trees. How do you deal with uh, learning achievements, the assessments of all those as opposed to just constantly overwhelming our children with examination after examination, even when you are running from a system that you're saying too much exam oriented, we are getting into one which is extremely exam oriented again. What is happening? How do we deal with issues of a management of schools and all that where the parents themselves take charge, not just being driven by uh, individuals who are in tenders and whose interests are totally different from the quality that we want in those schools? How do we ensure that our education links up with the uh, livelihood matters within the catchment areas. How do we ensure that education is uh, and education institutions are safe zones? And even our children, they know, even if they're struggling wherever, at least some feeding program is provided that they know they'll have a meal in there because without providing for that, we'll not still be helping. How do we ensure that our own education system in wholesomeness? is one that triggers the interests of the learners wherever they are, that they are constantly proud of it. And as such, I think based on the standards and the principles that we've agreed on as a Limubora working group, we are saying it is high time that as a country, we did a comprehensive national education policy. And indeed, we are willing, ready, and we have started consultation to spearhead that process. So these national conversations on education will continue. We are saying because of the issues of underfunding that you're seeing. Underfunding, even when education is receiving the largest share, is still being underfunded because the needs therein are not being met fully. So we still require a framework that would institutionalize education financing. And that's why we recommend the National Education Fund. And we are saying that in the event that we get it so right now, we do not want any leadership because we keep on having transitions, a leadership that would all of a sudden just declare fiat and uh, derogate from the good framework that we shall have agreed on. We want to ensure that the kind of education we want, a limutui takai, is one that would be protected from damage, from damage from the political leadership, from damage from those who want just to profiteer from it. And indeed, any future reform uh, process must be based on the philosophy that uh, nationally we shall have agreed to and human rights principles, which are also very known to us. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, without taking a lot of time, I'm just encouraging you that we cascade this conversation mm. about the education that we want. And for us, ni elimu bora sio bora elimu. Sio kila siku watu wako shuleni, lakini hakuna masomo ya naendelea. Asante ni sana. Thank you so much, uh, Boas, uh, for that passionate uh, presentation. And we can see the passion in you uh, in terms of the subject uh, presentation. You did touch on uh, education funding, and um, <clears throat> um, you've uh, put it rightly that uh, we'll be transitioning. On the state of uh, public education financing in Kenya, and um, as we are gathered here under this platform, we realize that the government is um we realize that um the government is the principal funder of education with the ministry of education being responsible for allocating funds to primary secondary and tertiary institutions uh we've been told that the government has made efforts to increase funding for education and we've seen that through the budget with the allocation of the sector the education sector increasing from Kenya shillings are 305 billion in the financial year 2019-2020 uh, fiscal year to 497.7 billion in the year 2021-2022. Uh, and currently, in this budget that we've just seen being passed, we've seen that 628.6 billion has been allocated for the financial year 
2024. Um, we are also uh, told that the government has implemented various policies to support education financing, including free primary education and secondary education. But we ask ourselves, is this education in primary and secondary really free? Has it ensured access by all children, regardless of the part of the country? And we also ask ourselves, are there various established funds, such as uh, the National Government Constituency Development Fund, because now it is very popular in terms of issuing bursaries and building classrooms, including the Higher Education Loans Board. And we've also been told that there's a new formula for financing of higher education at the university level, including the tertiary institutions. So this afternoon, we are privileged uh, to have an expert who is Dr. Emmanuel Manyasa, an expert and specialist in development economics, currently the executive director of Usawa Agenda, and has been a lecturer at the Kenyatta University. And we are privileged because he is a fellow, or he was a fellow at the Global Education Monitoring at the UNESCO. And again, indeed, we would want to interrogate and see whether the competence-based curriculum, um, which is the CBC, has uh, really provided a platform for uh, uh, affordable education, or it is expensive. Uh, and we will be hearing uh, from all of us when the time of asking questions, and we encourage all of you to even put your questions in the chat section. I can realize that we are more than 420 participants currently live on this discussion, so we might not be able to accord each one of us an opportunity to speak, but there is a platform on the chat section where you can put your question, seeking clarification, and the team uh, who are part of the organizers of this webinar will be flagging those so that I can read after the three presentations are for the response of the experts. Uh, at this juncture, allow me to welcome Dr. Emmanuel Manyasa, and we are so grateful that you are able to find time, even when you are away in the country, you committed to say that you are going to join this important national conversation about education. Karib sana, Dr. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Dr. Harry. Uh, yeah, I'm very grateful that uh, you invited me to this session, and, and I'm grateful to everyone who's taken their Friday afternoon to be here, because I realize everyone of us then understands uh, just how important uh, education is uh, for ourselves and for the country. And I I want to start by associating with the remarks made by uh, my senior boards earlier on the state of the country. And just to tell you that I'm in Rwanda, I'm in Kigali. I've been here before, uh, and I'm the type that never posts photos, but I am going to post some photos later on from the genocide memorial, uh, just to remind uh, the people who are uh, behaving badly in our country, that we are not different. We, we can actually uh, just go their way if we continue to be as irresponsible as, as we are behaving. Uh, and it is unfortunate that the adults are behaving irresponsibly and the consequences uh, can end up on our children. Uh, so I want to just appeal uh, to people in our country to realize uh, that wars have no winners. Uh, there are skulls of people who thought they would win uh, in the memorial alongside the skulls of the people they thought they were going to eliminate. So it's unfortunate and let's talk to the people we know uh, who are behaving badly to behave better for the sake of all of us. Uh, Joshua, I shared a slide with you. I would like you to share it for me so that uh, I can start with that as, uh, as one of the things that we will talk about. And I will try to use uh, 
as many more time as I can, but I'm going to also uh, make sure that I try to comprehensively touch on the issues uh, that we have to, to discuss, Be because we must all confirm and confess that there are serious challenges facing our education, and they require a uh, very sober-minded and sober approach so that we can be able to because education is one of those things you don't derail. If you derail it, getting it back on trail can be very difficult uh, because the mess you create will easily reproduce itself uh, in a very short time. So Joshua, are you able to share my slide? Hey, Odibo, uh, you can facilitate the sharing of the slide. But, but while while he's still uh, planning to share, let me respond uh, and give us uh, my own perspective of the of the question that uh, Bo has raised on education for what? Education since creation uh, serves three basic functions. Uh, you need education to survive. You need education to thrive. And you need education to live at peace with people and planet. It is from these core functions that our national goals for education are drawn. And if you look at even our national goals of education, plus these three functions for education that we have, they tell you that there is only one component uh, that is for private benefit to an individual who goes through education. When you're going through education, part of it is for your private gain, but most of it is not for your private gain. Most of it is for public good. And, and that is one reason why it is very critical that institutions work together and people and communities work together to make sure that every child in society gets a good education without saying it will be the parent's role because most of the education they get is for the benefit of society. Allow me to focus uh, briefly on this, on this slide that, that has been shared. I work for an organization known as USAW Agenda as it has been mentioned. At USAW Agenda, we are pursuing what we call education justice. That is our core mission. And our core mission is based on what we perceive as the current state of education in our country and what we believe can be achieved if we focused our minds to bring change. The two logos you see on that, on that, the, on that screen, the one on the left that has many colors, that to us describes what the current education system in our country and also in the world is that you go to school when what you get out of school is already predetermined. So, so that depending on your foundation, on the household where you come from, on the region where you come from, as uh, if you are in Kenya, de depending on whether you are a child with a disability or not, depending on whether you are a girl or a boy, you go to school, with their roots determining how your leaves will look like is predetermined. The school system is just a ritual through which you go. But if you came from a disadvantaged background, you will be a disadvantaged adult. That, that is what is de depicted in that tree that has many colors. Our own perception and, and, and imagination is that if we have a properly functioning education system, it should be able, because we are treating the, tree, the roots of the trees as the, the foundations, the different homesteads where we come from, the different characters that children bring to school, we consider the trunk as the education, and we see the branches as the adults who have emerged out of education. If we have a properly functioning education from what we imagine. It should be able to blunt all the disadvantages that children bring into education. 
so that after that, all those children are prosperous adults. And that's why the tree on the right shows you that all the branches are green, signifying being successful, albeit they don't have the same shape or same size, because education is not supposed to make everyone equal, but enable everyone to thrive in their own way, in the direction that they choose to go, or that they are talented to pursue. That is our vision of what a properly functioning education should be. And that is different than what we think is the current state where your base, your foundation, the home where you come from, your characteristics as a person determine what you become regardless of your going through school. I think you can remove the, you know, or you can maintain it there for the sake of questions if they will come. So having explained what we perceive as what should happen to our education system. The question that then comes is, what is hindering us, as a society, from achieving the vision that we have of a properly functioning education system? And several things are responsible. And, and I, won't, I want to go through them quickly, but also ask that you take notes and we can engage much more around these issues. Of course, the issue of funding has uh, been raised as a major factor, and that is true. But it, one of the things I want to make clear today is that government has been assumed to be by far the major fund of education. The data that is available shows that our government funds 52% of the cost of education in Kenya. 52% is funded by government, 40% is funded by parents, and 8% is funded by other actors, the NGOs, the multinational donors. So our government puts into our education system 52% of what is required to fund education. Therein, the first problem emerges or either the first problem emerged there. Because once we leave a significant portion of funding of education to parents, then, and without a clear mechanism of how the, the total population of parents will share the responsibility of, of funding education, then it becomes difficult to guarantee equal quality of education to the different segments of parents who are putting in different amounts of, 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 of funds into the education system. So that, that is one problem th that we have. The second problem that we have is that while parents are contributing 40% of the funds that go into education, parents have absolutely no voice in what happens in the education system. They are going to they are putting in money, but they have no voice. Our Basic Education Act recognizes the role of parents in education, but assigns them two supportive functions. One is fundraising, and the other one is discipline. So as a parent, when you're called to school, there are only two issues you are going to be asked. Either your child has been involved in indiscipline matters, or the school head is going to ask you for money. That is the second major problem, because it makes the school system unaccountable to the parent completely. And when the school system is unaccountable to the parent, it is unlikely that it will be accountable to the child who is going through it. So the school system is unaccountable to the parent, it's unaccountable to the child. And we expect that this same school system will serve the interest of the child and the parent who is actually the community. That is our second problem. The third problem is that communities have been asked to stay out of education. 
and told that their involvement is interference. But who is supposed to be served by the education that is being offered? It is the community. I mentioned three components. The only component that is for private gain is the component where you get education for thriving. And most of that is skill-based. The rest of the components of education for you to survive and for you to be able to live at peace with people and planet, that is for public good. The public includes the communities. Our, we have structured our school systems in, in a way that we keep communities away from the school. I have traveled quite a bit visiting models that work of education in places. I went to Brazil last year to a place called Sobral. Sobral is supposed to be like our Northern Kenya. The, 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 the dry parts of the country. They have implemented a model of involving communities in school operations that is bringing everyone from all over the world to visit, to see how it works. And here, when communities set up a school, carry stones sometimes on their own heads to start to build the first classroom. Once the school is taken over by government, they are told to stay away and they are totally excluded from any role in the functioning of those schools. That is our third problem. Our fourth problem is politicization of our education system. And I am talking about all this because they have implication on how we fund schools. And, and I'm going to come back to that. The easiest thing for a member of parliament in Kenya to do when they are elected, the so-called, the maendeleo they can bring is to set up a school. So what has been going on in our public education sector is that you have so many schools, so many tiny schools set up. And if you look at the Teacher Service Commission Act, it mandates the Teacher Service Commission to give a new school the principal. And then they tell you, we will give you other teachers when they become available and they never become available because for the last 10 years, Kenya has not employed any new teachers. They have only replaced teachers who have left service either through death, through retirement, or those who have resigned to do other, to pursue other paths in their own lives, or those who have been fired for disciplinary reasons. So, you set up a new school in sub-county A. What TSC does is to go to another school within that sub-county, pick the best performing teacher there, and promote them to become a head of this new school. And that new school now has a principal without teachers. So the children who come to that school are just growing up. There's no learning. Then the children who were in the school where this best performing teacher has been moved from are also facing lack of a teacher now, and the subject might always go and taught. So they also just start growing up. Yet, instead of this member of parliament setting up a new school, they could just have created an additional stream to that old school. Because in most cases, the distance is not much between the schools. So that politicization is a big problem to funding of education in this country. Because as it has already been indicated, education already receives the highest budget allocation in the country. There is very little likelihood that that budget will be increased because there are many other sectors competing for the same funds. Since it is unlikely that that expansion will be made. The challenge that we face now is to make sure that the funding that is being provided by the government through the Ministry of Education is allocated efficiently. And that is not the case. It's not the case now because we are allocating a lot of those funds to setting up new schools. We are also allocating those funds unfairly. 
And, and what do I mean by that? Until the year that just ended, and I'm here to look at the current budget proposals to see whether this has been maintained, there has been 300 million shillings set up every year for national schools upgrading. So you can imagine that you are giving national schools, which are educating 3% of Kenyan children, 300 million every year for the last 10 years, when we have sub-county schools educating 65% of our children in secondary schools, many of them without even a single lab, without a library, some of them without adequate classrooms. We are giving this money to 3%, most of whom are privileged. And let no one lie to you that national schools are accessible to every child who is bright. <laughs> that is hogwash. Yeah, there are children from well-to-do backgrounds joining national schools with very low marks. I, I, sent, I escorted a friend of mine to take his son to admission in one of the national schools, and the principal spoke interestingly. He said, some of you have come here through the gate, and some of you have come here through the, the farm. And he went on to elaborate. Those who have come through the farm are those whose fathers called me and said, help my son, help my son. I am going to make sure that by the time you leave the school, you are at the same level with those who came through the gate. So that is the reality, that the national schools are educating a privileged minority, and we have been allocating them lots of resources at the expense of the schools that require those resources. Besides that, we have been allocating what we are calling free primary education monies strictly to what we say are public schools. But if you go to our informal settlements, there are no public schools. So children there are forced to attend low-cost private schools. And you want to tell me that a child in Mukuru Kwanjenga who has no public school and is attending a low-cost private school, is rich. That child does not deserve capitation, but the child in Westlands Primary, the child in Kilimani Primary, deserves capitation because they're in a public school. So that model is itself very flawed, and it is one that has to change. Having said that, there is expenses that have come with the implementation of CBC. And, and let me be very sincere here. I believe that CBC is a very good model of education. It's a very good curriculum that is horrendously being implemented. Horrendously because we rushed. Horrendously because we introduced it with the cane in the hand. TSE in particular was the culprit here, telling teachers if we don't come for training over the weekend, you will see. And the teachers went to those trainings but learned nothing because they didn't believe in it. They were not given sufficient time to understand it. And so a lot of the failures and a lot of the challenges we see parents having to deal with are coming from teachers who never got trained who can't interpret the, the curriculum and who are required to teach because it is an order. And, and that is undermining the CBC in a big way. It is also being horrendously implemented because for a long time, and it's not fair to speak about someone who is not there, but for a long time, we made noise, appealed to Magoha and told him, sit in the office and think through implementation of CBC, but he was busy running around saying, I'm building classrooms. Doing the work of the sub-county commissioners of education, sub-county directors, while his own work, ministerial level strategic leadership work was not being done. And I don't know whether the current leadership is doing it because we have lacked that strategic leadership to implement this change 
Because this change is huge. This change has massive implications. I'm very scared that we are doing very badly with the junior secondary school. And yet we are two years away to senior secondary school and senior secondary school requires even much more preparation than we needed for junior secondary. Actually, I hear the stories of, we have junior secondary domicile in the primary schools, and that is a huge failure because if you read the CBC framework, it doesn't talk about domiciling anywhere. The 48 page document has no word domicile. It envisages primary school, junior school, and senior school. We are not doing well on that, and we are creating a problem for parents because parents have to deal with the child every day. The child wakes up, goes to school, they're in grade seven, they come home and they tell you, we haven't learned. From Monday to Friday, we haven't learned. And you can't, as a parent, deal with that. Yet, as a country... Uh, Doctor, you have five minutes. Doctor, you have five minutes. Yes, I, I'll finish within those five. So, as, as a hands. country, we have to deal with these realities. And ask ourselves, how do we make sure that we have funding models that work? So, one of the things that, from where we sit, needs to be done to make sure that we are able to implement this CBC. It's one, run this campaign that, that, that Elimutu Itakayo is on, but also target the middle class Kenyan who thinks that the solution is to run away from this system and take their children to the international school. One of the functions of education in Kenya is to create responsible citizens. You cannot create a responsible citizen of Kenya who has attended education systems that teach them nothing about Kenya. We are actually undermining one of the key goals of education. Speak to the middle class Kenyans. That, that is one. The second thing that needs to happen urgently is to review the funding model. It makes no sense that you have a child who goes to a very high cost primary school in the country paying 300,000 a year or, or a term, and then they join Alliance and now government subsidizes them. We can change that around and make every parent carry their weight and make it possible then for the extra funds to support the children who deserve to be supported so that they are able to access quality education. Number three, we need to do a consolidation at all levels. We have things in this country called universities which are not even qualified to be mid-level colleges. We can consolidate universities, we can consolidate secondary schools that are within walking distance of each other and each has three teachers and put all those teachers into one school, make it six so that the, the children can access all the subject teachers rather than uh, having... Dr. you are breaking. I don't know, maybe you could uh, uh, do away with your video. I think it's your network. Okay. So I am saying, can you hear me? Are you able to hear me? Yeah, though still breaking, but better. Yes, I think yeah, we can okay. hear him clearly. Uh, Ndugu Cornelius, can you, Ndugu Joshua, can you check your link? Probably it could be from your end. Okay. Thank you. So, 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 I'm saying that we can consolidate our institutions and put them in a more efficient functional mode so, so that we don't scatter teachers into too many small schools when they are some of them within walking distance of each other. 
and we can be able then to build bigger schools that are better resourced and better uh, managed. The third thing, the fourth thing that I think is urgent to do is to give parents and communities a bigger say in schools to ensure efficiency in utilization of the resources that come to schools, but also create ownership that will enable members of society who don't necessarily have children in the particular schools to contribute to the financing and management of those schools. Because in the end, education is largely a public good. And whoever gets that education, only a small component of it private benefits them privately, the rest benefits society. So even those people in the communities who have no children who are school going have an interest in what happens in the school, have an interest in what comes out of that school. I, I have been telling some friends who are telling me, you know, there's nothing happening with this junior second. That is true and it must concern everyone because whether we teach these children or not, there will be engineers coming out of them. There will be doctors coming out of them. They will treat us in our old age. Question is, will they be prepared for that function? So it's important that, that we keep that in mind and get communities involved in the school. The, the fifth thing that we need to do is to engage with funders from outside of the country who are supporting education in Kenya to make sure that they are not just engaging with government and trying to support everything that government tells them, but that they are also engaging with us, with the public, who have an inalienable stake in education in this country, to make sure that what they are going to support in education here is something that is of priority to us. Because, and I say this because there has been pushed to invest much more in TVETs and, and I have no problem with that. But I have a problem with sudden massification of TVETs. Because for a long time, TVETs were ignored. There was no manpower developed for teaching in those TVETs. If you suddenly create 500, 1,000 TVET institutions, who is teaching in those institutions? You are taking these children there, they will get certification that means nothing because there was no competent tutors. So I am opposed to massification of TVET, sudden massification, because it will undermine the quality of what comes out of TVET and in the end, the TVET certificates will mean nothing. But that is being funded generally from external sources. We need to get those funders to listen to all of us, to understand what we prioritize and what we consider as critical in being able to move our education forward. I think that we need to get the private sector to play its role in education. Because the private sector has only played a role to, to a very small extent where many of them are investors in private schools. The private sector is a consumer of what comes out of education. And the quality of what comes out of our education system determines the frontier for private sector growth. So the private sector needs to be woken up to that fact and gotten to engage in contributing to the growth of our education sector and to guarantees of equal quality of education to all our children. If we don't, if we allow education systems that are fraught with embedded injustices such as what we have now to, to last, of course, one, it violates the rights of the children which are guaranteed in our constitution and all the international protocols we have committed to. Two, it bottles up the country's potential for growth. Because we now say good education will be for those who can afford, regardless of whether they are the good minds. 
and we restrict the good minds from accessing good quality education because they can't afford. What we are doing is limiting the potential of the country. And finally, that is intrinsically, it has intrinsic inbuilt conflict because you're going to get the less intelligent on top and the intelligent below the less intelligent and IQ does not come from attending school. So the less intelligent who are saddled by the the, the intelligent who are saddled by the less intelligent because they couldn't access education will always engage in which matter now games with those above them. It is fraught with conflict. And we can avoid that by looking at our funding models and resetting of our priorities in terms of what deserves prioritization in allocation of the limited funds that we have. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Daktari, uh, for that wonderful presentation. And um, I urge participants to take note of any questions that they may be having uh, so that um, they get an opportunity uh, to ask. And they can also utilize the chat section uh, to enable us to capture as many questions as possible during the question and answer session. Um, <clears throat> I can see there are people who are raising up their hands. Um, we will listen to the uh, final presenter, and then now we will come to participants to ask their questions. Um, as we move to the final presentation, in June 2022, the International Labour Conference uh, included a safe and healthy working environment in the International Labour Organization uh, framework of fundamental principles and rights of work. And the big question is, uh, our learning institutions are also spaces of work, just like supermarkets and factories, because they are people uh, including teachers, parents, students, learners, pupils, and even the subordinate staff who should be guaranteed psychological safety in the school environment. Safety in our schools is a fundamental subject that has to be put in place with the utmost uh, consideration in order uh, to facilitate the safety of the under 18, because we are talking about children. A, a, a school is just a public space that needs attention just like any other. And in Kenya, we have the Directorate of Safety and Health, which is popularly known as the DOSH under the Ministry of Labor. But we ask ourselves, do the fire extinguishers in our schools uh, get inspected or guarantee safety just if there's a fire? But we've seen a loss of lives such as the stampede that was in Kamega Primary School. And when there was an audit of the safety measures and standards of that school, it was established that safety measures were compromised. And uh, um, it also meant that even other schools were ill-equipped and prepared to guarantee the safety of children. And we've seen the rampant rise in food poisoning just as a result of poor storage of food um, uh, in, 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 in the school stores, uh, where schools engage just by uh, profiting from uh, a large economies of scale by purchase of uh, large quantities of uh, grains, such as beans and maize, and they can be even stored for two years. So you can imagine grain stock for two years uh, in terms of um, the guaranteed safety because there would be accumulation of uh, moisture content, as well as also alphalotoxin, and they also, um, you know, infestation by, you know, weevils, which and, uh, in the end uh, would provide food that is not conducive uh, for human consumption. Uh, this afternoon, or this evening, we are privileged to have Dr. Teresa Kinyari uh, from um, the University of Nairobi, uh, Faculty of Health Sciences, and in the Department of Human Anatomy and Medical uh, Physiology. Uh, she is a clinical epidemiologist uh, who understands. I've had the privilege to share a panel in one of the leading media houses to discuss healthy and food uh, safety. 
and even safety of our children in our schools. And uh, we would like to hear from her, make a brief presentation. I know she has a, a presentation in form of a slide uh, where a depot, or depot will be assisting to project so that we can follow closely uh, together uh, as she makes that uh, presentation. Karibu sana, Dr. Kinyari. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Joshua, uh, for your kind words. And uh, indeed, it was a privilege uh, to have met you in June. And it's really a privilege that uh, we have continued uh, this uh, relationship to collaborate, to be able to help our children in their schools. So this afternoon, um, this, this evening, I'm really uh, privileged to uh, be able to present my thoughts and we can have a discussion on uh, what we can do because I believe there's a lot uh, that we can be able to do. Maybe the, the next slide. Oh, can I, can I share? so that it's easy for me to transition. Yes, it's, it's easier for you, Dr. Okay. You can share your screen. Okay. Uh, we, we we ask participants who are who are not able to mute to mute. Mm. Are you able to see? Is it visible? Yes, we can be able to see it. Okay, okay. So I I I, I really went through the historical perspective of schools, and I don't know if most of you are familiar with this paper by Theodore Natsulas, which really looked at the human rights issue uh, around even how the uh, colonial government uh, started uh, the schooling system. And the reason why I'm bringing uh, this up is that we have a lot of uh, power as parents and uh, acti activism has really changed uh, the trajectory of our schools, just to show that this actually happened in the 1920s and it changed the way in which uh, schools were set up. So this particular paper, I'd want you to, maybe in your own time, uh, just to look at it, but I've shared it here in full. So in the 1920s, we had the British educational policy in Kenya. And of course, you know, as colonialists, their goal was to create um, a small group of semi-literate uh, good Christians and also educate people through a village-oriented agriculture, which is a, a really good thing. And this is one of the things I felt that it was started at that time and somehow we've not been able to continue uh, to be able to uh, 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 use uh, to, to start uh, orienting our children in agriculture. And also the, the, the focus was also on vocational uh, education, which was a skill-based curriculum. And really, we are, we are back there now with the competency-based curriculum. So you can see the intentions ha have been uh, similar across the board and uh, the circumstances probably different. But um, I just wanted to take you back memory lane to see these ideas have been there for a long time and, and what was done then and what can be done now the power is really in the hands of parents and uh, activism. So around the 1980s, the, a group of parents uh, at that time felt that uh, the mission schools had a monopoly. There was a quality and uh, the, they, they had concerns about the quality and availability of education because only a few children could access it. So enrollment was low. And even then, uh, the students were only taught basic literacy and vocational skills. We didn't have the advanced kind of uh, learning that we have here. And I guess maybe at that time, the demands for technology were not there. And that, that was really a way of uh, getting uh, people to get uh, uh, educated. But then in 1929, uh, they became, uh, there, there was actually an activism that um, demanded the end of that monopoly. And this really brings out the power. And in terms of health and safety, 
I really want to align this to the, the health and safety conditions we have in the schools. We can't just continue, the government should do, the government should do. We really need to see how best we can be able to, through activism, put an end to some of the monopolies. For example, uh, Boas has talked about monopolies in uh, suppliers in schools or monopolies in how schools are managed. Th that, can, that is something that can be done. And at this time in 1929, the activists actually demanded that the government should establish more schools so that there'd be more enrollment, or they also gave them an option of creating independent schools. So uh, at that point, then independent schools were formed. And uh, this was over a period of about 22 years. But there was a lot of inconsistency, discouragement, and tolerance, and a lot of government control, even at that time. So I, I just wanted to bring out that most of the human rights issues have been there from the beginning. There's not so much documentation about the health and safety issues that were there at that time, but I would assume they had to do with um, infectious uh, diseases like malaria and other conditions. I, I wasn't really able to get uh, any of that. But my point here is that we still had a skill-based curriculum at that time. Parents uh, uh, were able to, through the activism, change the course of the education in the country, and I believe this can still be done. So another interesting thing that I wanted to share with you is that uh, most of the times we think that our population is growing and increasing in number. And uh, I, I really wanted to show how the population pyramid has changed over time from the 1950s and uh, will change over time as you go towards 2030 and 2050. But, the, but in summary, the, the main thing is that we basically have a very large number of young learners at uh, ECD and in the primary schools. And over time, as a pop by the time we get to 2030 and 2050, we we'll basically, let me see whether we can be able to just pick this so that you have a visual. So this is basically the, the population uh, structure that we had uh, in uh, 20, um, that, we, that, we, that we, we, we had in 1963. And I, I picked this because it's a point at which we had, uh, uh, we had um, independence. You can see from the early childhood uh, levels going up to the schools, we had a, a large uh, pyramid. And if you go back again now to the 50s, uh, based on what we have discussed here, around the time when there was an emergency, the, the pyramid was even, there were many more there were many more children. And of course, these are the ones who didn't access school because of the what had happened at that time. But as we move on now with the years, now let's take ourselves uh, to around uh, 1990. I think that's around the time when the 844 system started. We still had a large number of, uh, of uh, a broad pyramid. Then we come to our time now here, we are at 2023. I'm an epidemiologist, so I, I really like uh, being able to see the numbers uh, as you go. Look at the way our population uh, pyramid is changing. We are having fewer children. I know there are places where some primary schools have actually closed. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is that we talk about congestion, we talk about numbers, but are we, what are we planning for the future, generally for the country? Because infrastructure is very expensive to put in. We must have a short term, more of a long term uh, projection of what we need. So you can see the, the way the population pyramid is shrinking uh, up to 2023. And that means that we have fewer learners at ECD relatively, and you can see more learners uh, in the tertiary, uh, assuming that uh, with 100% transition, then we have more learners going into secondary schools and, and, and uh, that truncating on to the tertiary school. So that means that our investments should actually now be moving towards not just the early childhood uh, development, but then start moving towards uh, secondary and, and tertiary institutions. Then as you go on, you find that uh, by the time we, we, we have this magic 2030, you remember with vision 2030, how will it be by, although we are not so far, for the vision you see the pyramid, will still be thinning off. We actually now are approaching more of a developed, because um, uh, we are a low middle income country. And then uh, if you want to project up to 2050, 
Now, as a policy maker, you see, we, we need to invest more in the tertiary and the, the middle level colleges that um, Boas uh, has talked about. And that really means that we need to think about our investment in terms of infrastructure uh, based on the population projection. We don't build facilities now without having an idea of how they are going to be uh, in, the, in, the, in the future. So I just wanted to bring that out so that at the back of our minds, we are very clear about uh, what, uh, how, what, what, what we need to do. So generally, as we grapple with congestion in schools, we need to ask ourselves, uh, in terms of our population growth, what are the long-term uh, changes that we can make? Because at the end of the day, health and safety, the bottom line is really the congestion. Even for the mental health of the children, it's always about congestion. So it's good for us to think about the population growth. 100% transition is a good goal because unlike what had happened previously, we didn't have a, it, education was a privilege and now we know it's a right under the constitution. But the reality is that we have limited uh, boarding facilities and boarding, uh, maintenance of boarding facilities is expensive and that has to do with food and that has to do with accommodation, it has to do with water and sanitation, and those are the issues that now uh, need to be addressed, and I shall highlight some of those as we as we continue. We also know that in a bit to be able to relieve the congestion within the schools, we've had uh, uh, the blended kind of uh, 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 attendance in schools where we have some day scholars at adopting, uh, attending the boarding schools. So I just wanted now with this slide to just give us, uh, ask ourselves, yes, we're in 2023. If you're investing in infrastructure, who should we be investing for, for 2030 and 2050? Because that is how we are, we are going to get out of the rut, the, 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 the maze of uh, always having problems. Then I also just wanted to highlight, and I know some of you may have come across this uh, comprehensive um, uh, school health policy, and again, around the human rights uh, uh, agenda, I, I really wanted to bring out several issues among these uh, thematic areas. There was a school health policy in 2009, and what we have here now is the second edition, which is uh, 2018. And in terms of disease prevention and control, I think we've done very well with HIV and AIDS. We've done very well with, uh, 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 with malaria. But there's still room uh, to do quite quite a lot uh, in terms of uh, disease prevention and uh, and control. And the main thing is that uh, it, it's contextual. There are places where jiggers are a problem. There are places where you find that uh, most of the most of the children have malnutrition. In fact, a study that was done uh, in the in, in a, a, survey, a health a nutrition survey that was done, it showed that a lot of children are stunted, means that they don't get enough nutrition for a long time. And of course, this affects their learning. And that's why then uh, the children's rights and responsibilities really need to be very clear, or, because the children may not have uh, the knowledge that what their rights are. So this uh, activism for their rights and responsibilities really need uh, to come from the parents. And I think Boas also talked about one of uh, Boas talks about talked about the school feeding program. I really feel that the school feeding program should be universal. It shouldn't just be for uh, uh, maybe the underprivileged because we have children in Nairobi within an Nairobi estate who are actually starving because of the economy. So it's one of the things I felt that it's something that we used to have nyayo, nyayo milk during our time, uh, regardless of your socioeconomic status. And I think this is something that uh, as parents, we can actually be able to uh, have some activism for. I shall talk more about water sanitation and hygiene and also really focus on menstrual health. Again, this is uh, an issue that um, uh, we need to address and I would want us to think about in our discussion how best uh, we want to address it. Then there was gender growth and uh, development and also uh, value skills, value uh, and life skills. And uh, this really has to do with, um, although students learn about social studies, uh, I think Boas talked about a community, uh, the community being kept out of the schools, yet the community is able to provide a very good uh, social safety net for the children. For example, we have this 
uh, older people who have retired, and they can be a very good source of wisdom and direction for young children as they grow up so that they don't get into teenage pregnancies and uh, other conditions. But most of the time you find that uh, we, we don't open up uh, the schools for them. Again, of course, that has to be done carefully, but I, uh, I, this is one of the ways in which you can be able to inculcate values and also be able to give more of mentorship and 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 career um, give some kind of career mentorship for the for the children as as they go go along. Again, inevitably there's a special needs for disability and rehabilitation, and again also the school infrastructure and environmental health safeguards. So these are the thematic areas, and because of time, I won't talk touch on all of them. I've just picked a few. To just to be able to uh, for us to uh, motivate some discussion. So the one thing is about uh, healthy eating and physical activity. And uh, again, it has to do with the sensitization. We know what is a healthy diet. I think we always think if you're doing very well, you must do sausages and, and all that. And that, of course, takes you to the other extreme of obesity. But again, you find that the, just the knowledge about what healthy diet should be is also very important. So again, this an entry point now for the government is to be able to provide healthy lunches, as you, you can see there in schools. And that over time will, will actually uh, be able to help uh, children uh, and parents to move into healthy diets. Uh, we know sugar, there's a lot, you know, juice is very easy to put in a child's box, but that's sugar. The child is just taking sugar, and of course, they'll just sleep in class. So again, this is one way in which the nutrition department and the government can be able to start getting people into healthy eating. Then uh, we also think about uh, inadequate fruits and vegetables. And I think um, technically everybody thinks fruits and vegetables are expensive. And a, a, a national survey that was done in 2015 looked, uh, showed that even as adults, we don't take enough fruits and vegetables. And yet this is what is required even for brain function and even for health. Uh, and for flu. So inevitably, this is one of the things that need to be uh, addressed. And these are things that can be grown within the school compound uh, without, without any additional cost. This can be one of the CBC activities that the students will do in the school, and that, of course, uh, will make a difference. Then there's the issue of a cooking food. We know that, especially for vegetables, um, you find that you lose most of the vitamins that are required. And Joshua talked about the expired food granaries uh, the, because of the uh, mass uh, 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 the mass uh, procurement. And this, of course, uh, becomes a big issue because of aflatoxin. And also uh, because aflatoxin then has a risk of liver cancer and other conditions uh, later uh, in, the, in the child's life. Again, the other thing is just the lack of awareness in the board of management, because this is where the decisions are made in terms of how much, uh, what, what should be bought, and even in terms of uh, physical activity. These are, this is where uh, the, the sensation should be. Then uh, excessive prep time. I, I think I saw, was it Omar Abdullahi uh, in one of the chats as uh, the, the session was going on? Uh, and basically he mentioned that um, uh, children in northeastern uh, or, or in rural areas uh, may not have time to read at night because um, they basically do not have uh, electricity. And uh, for me, uh, uh, when you think about even in Finland, Finland only has five hours of of school every day. Usually, school starts at nine in the in the in the morning, and it's all about uh, allowing the children to play, 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 play more so that they can be able to have better focus and have a better attention span. We know children have a generally even adults we have a short attention span. I don't see why we should have prep 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 even on Sundays you have prep you have prep after it's just too much prep. I think as board of management and as parents, you need to decide how much prep time your child should have. Because when you um, relax and uh, you actually play, then you actually have a fresh mind to come and do more within that very short time. It's, one, it's a one conversation that doesn't need uh, funding, one conversation that doesn't need um, 
any 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 physical uh, intervention is just one conversation that we must have for the sake of the mental health of our children and for the sake of the stress that they have to go through we are pushing them too much to get these grades they are not playing as children because sometimes they are not playgrounds uh, because of a lot of land grabbing that has taken place and these are some of the things we need to ask as uh, as parents and as uh, as teachers how best uh, we can be able to do that because children need to play so that they can continue growing. So these are the, the solutions that I propose, and uh, this uh, this is what I thought uh, would need to uh, consider, and we can continue this conversation. The other thing that uh, Joshua also mentioned is uh, very preventable uh, 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 tragedies that we have had. Loss of lives, Jangule. I mean, we have a we have a whole spate of school fires every year, and it's a it's a perpetual problem. Which by now we should have had a very good program on fire drills to be able to as as a routine uh, in schools. We find that uh, as Joshua talked about uh, extinguishers. We do, we do do all schools have extinguishers, and even if they do, you know, some of them are just like for the picture, for the sake of ticking, for the, when the disaster management team comes, for the sake of just ticking the box. No, how many people know how to handle the extinguisher? Can it be easily be removed when there's a fire? And this is where now the fire drills come in, in terms of uh, being able to help uh, uh, the teachers and the students to get any protection. They also need to learn about uh, about um, first aid. If a children, if there's a fire, how do you prevent suffocation? How do you resuscitate? Do you have the basic skill and equipment to do? Again, this is a very important thing that as parent, as parents, we need to consider in the schools and not really take it for granted because we end up just having like a knee jerk uh, reaction when some of these things take place. So the solution here is to engage the fire department to train schools on fire drills. And again, this has to be done carefully, uh, like uh, what Joshua said, because sometimes some of these drills can uh, end up causing um, can end up causing a stampede, but this is something that should be done. For example, when you think about it in the schools where you have been, is there any place uh, that uh, we, we usually uh, have like a like a, a a meeting point or a safety po safety point for meeting uh, when when we have uh, any fires? Uh, most likely uh, they may not be, or if even if they are they are there, children do not know how best uh, they can be able to respond. A common thing is that. In, in a school, you can actually ask, where is your friend? So you, if you have an a, a counterboard for your friend so that at any time when there's a fire, so long as you know where your friend is, then everybody is accounted for. And this is because the numbers of students are very, are very, uh, are very, uh, are very high. Students, uh, teachers cannot be able to, uh, to cope with this. We also need to ask ourselves, those grills that we have for security in the dormitories and in the classrooms, how useful are they when you have a fire? This is, has been one of the tra uh, ways in which children have been trapped and have, ha have lost their lives because they just couldn't get out. Is there a, a way in which you can balance security and at the same time have some readiness uh, in case of a fire? That's again is something that's important for our conversation. But it's important for us to have regular fire drills, monitoring and reporting. And I was very happy to find that uh, we have some firefighting and first aid courses, uh, one for two months uh, in, uh, in uh, I think, somewhere in Thika and Eldoret. We also have uh, also a professional firefighting course. I think that's supposed to be five months. And um, we have no firefighting training at the university, whether you need it or not. I, that's another question uh, to think about, but I think we need to introduce uh, some of these courses, even as a common course uh, for security. For water and sanitation, I think uh, we've, is something that uh, we mentioned before, and again, you're familiar with all these issues uh, related to clean water, sanitation, and the menstrual hygiene management. And the whole idea is to just be able to sample water for toxicology. And you think about it when a, a, a new construction, you, you normally do an environmental impact assessment when a new building is coming out in terms of the proximity. But think about new developments around the school uh, with evolution. 
how has the water supply changed in terms of uh, sewage and uh, contamination? So it's good to regularly have some sample the water for toxicology, just to make sure that the fluoride levels are okay and that there are no effluents coming from nearby uh, factories that have gotten into the system. And provision of clean running water, I, I think as uh, our, our Ruku said, is not a political, uh, it should not be a, be a political uh, uh, promise. It's a, it's a right. As children have, have a right to get clean running water. And this is one of the things, again, that has to be addressed. Again, even with urbanization, this is supposed to be a participatory uh, activity where you bring in the town and county planners to try and see, as you're adding more uh, institutions, how has is urbanization affecting the schools in terms of water and sewage? Then the next thing is on food safety, and I think this I shall not belabor because you already talked about it. What I really wanted to focus on was the food labels because it has not uh, been mentioned. And uh, if this is uh, very important, and this is where now as parents, because of the monopoly of suppliers, they don't, for example, the, the, some, some of the food, some of the supplies may even be in Chinese, you may not be able to understand or may, may not uh, have the appropriate language. Uh, uh, or the, the one that can be read. The parents should know where this food is coming from. So it should actually be labeled and also the ingredients that this food uh, has and also the storage conditions, the date of manufacture and the date of expiry. And that will be very important uh, so that you're able to track uh, how, that, that, that you have food safety. Again, there's always the risk of uh, storage of uh, agricultural herbicides and pesticides uh, being having that contamination to a water source or a food source. So these are some of the things you need to think about. There's also the regular testing of food, food handlers. Usually the Ministry of Health requires you to have a quarterly or, a, or half yearly testing of food handlers. Who checks this? Does the PT and the, and the, and the, and the Board of Management have those certificates that uh, if, if they were asked, they would be able to provide. I think those are some of the things that we need to, to consider. Again, also engaging small scale, scale farmers to, uh, to be suppliers in the neighborhood instead of buying in bulk. Uh, that, those are some of the things you need to consider. And uh, lastly, I'd like to talk about the teacher and the workers in the school. Who takes care of them? He's a teacher who has initially, I think there were about 30 to 40 students uh, in a class. And now the, the teacher has about 100 uh, of almost between 100 and 200 students who takes care of them in terms of the uh, teaching load and uh, even the pressure to excel. The, how many A's have you produced? How many is and then the long working hours they have to put in. So this again uh, is very important and I, some of the things that I think uh, we should allow the teachers to even go for team building the health they have, but also provide accommodation and look at their mental health. And there are many other suggestions that you may have on uh, school wellness. So my question is uh, to you, and we can actually uh, uh, be able to discuss this. What must we do to make a change? Because it will be immoral for us to continue having health and safety in schools the way it, it, uh, the way it is right now. We must be honest with ourselves and say, what can we do to make a change? And this just to show you that um, we've come from a long way from the colonial times, and uh, we, we have a lot of adjustments to do. So I'd like to thank you for listening and I'd like to welcome questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Joshua, are you in a position to speak now? Joshua was transitioning from, a loca from his location to a better place. Uh, thank uh, you, Dr. Uh, uh, Cornelius, I've, I've arrived on my new location. Okay, thank you. Take on. Yeah, good. Thanks so much for that support. And uh, thanks, Dr. for that presentation. I know it's a very complex subject that uh, we take it lightly, usually when we are in schools. Uh, even parents, when they are taking their children to school, do they even realize that they need to have knowledge about the safety of their children in that school, or it's about just academics. Thank you, Dr. 
uh, nafasi ya kujua kama kuna emergencies mtoto pia amelimika kujua if there is fire outbreak in that school does the child have knowledge of the map of the school so uh, that is a very good uh, presentation done by daktari i know um there are so many hands up and we are more than 400 of us um i can see um but i've asked the uh, alvin and the duncan to do a summary of the questions so um alvin and the duncan if you may read some of the questions and then uh, the presenters will be able to see which one is relevant to their areas of presentation i think that would be the best way to go about handling the questions and even the questions that have been that had been submitted to creco in advance so that at least we can see those ones and have a moment of reflection uh, duncan you can uh, alvin you can read the questions Is Alvin in the meeting? Hey, Alvin, we are requesting for your support if you can read those questions. Okay. okay. Uh, I don't know why uh, Dominic has not unmuted me. Uh, Duncan, you should be should be unmuted uh, the way you are. I gave uh, Alvin access also, unless he changed an account, the account. All right. So can you all hear me? Y yes, you can, Duncan. Um. Yes. So maybe I can start with one of the um comments from um a good to Victor. He's on Facebook. He says just a concern. From my side, let the team reach uh, the ground to hear from the local parents, students before submission of the report or uh, findings. And I think that is in regard to uh, the presidential working party report. Um, I, maybe I should read through and then you can take note. Um, it's also first class M uh, from the chat box says that I'm interested in this because of children with disabilities and especially those with developmental disability. It's an observation that children with autism spectrum in different parts of the country have been wasting uh, in the just closing curriculum of 844 in our schools. And further, there has been mis misplaced, uh, mm, uh, this has been, there has been misplacement of, of these children in mental schools where they are even lost and confused more. Um, moving on, we also have Omar from the comment says that there, there are other challenges um include lack of infrastructure no enough class for children also the power uh, challenges in some remote areas and you also continue to say that the marginalized areas like my own area ijara county need more non-governmental organizations for financial support basically uh, materials needed in cbc lessons so i think omar is uh, mentioning on uh, uh, on how in his uh, area uh, it's the non government organizations that are supporting um, the school, but the government could not be um, uh, really available, especially even supporting the uh, basic materials needed for the CBC lesson. Uh, moving on, uh, we have one other one from uh, Ali uh, M. Who says, how do we enhance inclusion of children with disabilities in an inclusive classroom set up by providing the um, site infrastructure, especially learners with autism and other related developmental disabilities, um, such as cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, uh, intellectual disabilities, and specific uh, learning disabilities? Um, that is, I think, another second concern with regard to children with autism. We also have one from Priska M, who says that um, as Eli Mubora working group, have you maybe thought of asking the government and the opposition to engage in peace talks 
as you can all, all see without heat, where the protests have been rampant, children have been affected greatly. Um, I know Boaz, you see that too. Uh, then we can go to Ivan Kipkirui, who says that I believe to be a good curriculum, but with the state of our economy, we were never ready for its implementation. The problem is we are compare, comparing ourselves to other countries which have developed long ago. Take, for example, pupils are asked to use their parents' smartphones to do some assignments. My question is, how many parents have smartphones? How frequent do they even buy bundles? Moving on to Sylvia Inesalaon, who says, do the government know we are passing a lot, are passing through a lot of challenges in CDC in terms of material resources? Uh, that is the way awareness of government on what is happening on the ground. Then maybe a last one. Uh, the last one uh, we can have. The last one we can have is um, from uh, Michael, who says that how can we push for review of the so-called CPC um, to be efficient, relevant, and cost-effective for parents? Thank you. I think uh, that could be enough for now. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Khan, for that summary presentation of the questions. Uh, Boas Waruku, is there any question that touches on your area? I think uh, there was mention of Elimubora. If you can um, just have a minute, and then we can go to Dr. Manyasa, and finally, Dr. Kinyari. Thank you. Um... I'm not so sure how much time you're saying how one minute uh, because there are a number of issues which have been raised, but I'll limit myself maybe to the two minutes. Uh, one, uh, it would be good to restate uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Kinyari actually talked about, Teresa, on uh, the school management and uh, the accessibility uh, to those schools particularly uh, the role of the parents in the management there. I uh, wanted to indicate uh, the aspects that uh, as we speak now, you know, the media are actually not having access to the mm -hmm. schools. Boss, could you raise your voice a bit? Hello? Uh, you're a bit low. Is, is my voice okay? Yeah, move uh, forward like that. It's becoming better. It's getting... Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So I'm I'm saying I was uh, re-emphasizing what Dr. Teresa uh, had indicated, um, accessibility to many of those schools, but also the fact that then the parents' input and uh, their role in the management is really being taken for granted. I said this is something that needs to be uh, revisited because uh, the role that the parents should play or uh, should actually be more uh, re-emphasized. Why? Because they are the ones who understand uh, where the, the rubber actually meets the road. They are the ones who are being called upon whenever the school is inadequate to provide certain things. So their role in that management system should be really uh, be enhanced. But I also wanted to indicate that uh, their obstruction that the Matiangi Magoa uh, rules brought in, where media are, are not allowed to access the schools. Machogu has continued with that kind of practice because the media only um, accompanies him, but uh, the media on their own are not really uh, allowed to access those schools. That should be uh, removed because uh, uh, open schools would uh, allow for a little bit more of uh, uh, transparency or feedback on that. Omar, uh, your, 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 your talk about how the parents can be supported, the Ijara case, I think this is also similar to what I saw uh, previously from uh, Tana River, the queries they were raising were also a lot to do with how the parents can be supported uh, to provide for this uh, learning materials. But you realize that, uh, you know, when you are uh, uh, making recommendations and even transitioning into a system, uh, the kind of planning that it requires is uh, laborious. 
and you require to make also adequate resource provision to have those materials in place. For example, even if you wanted to ask or appeal to the NGOs in Kenya and beyond, how many of them would be able to support all this uh primary schools jss and the senior schools to get even smartphones for the children uh, to be able to, uh, to carry out the assignments remember uh, the children that we promised a laptop a child are now in form two and they are yet to, to even see those and so i think we need to a better way would be to look at how do we uh, equip the schools in such a way that the learning areas that you want them to go through can be supported. Can, the teachers have been uh, inducted or retooled, as they call it, refreshed, so that they are able to deliver the material. And at the same time, they have the tools and equipment to be able to deliver it. And even the teachers themselves are in good numbers, not currently where we are having 1.5 uh, teachers per JSS. Uh, with all those learning areas. You know that no learning is taking place there. So uh, it would be good, yes, where uh, some NGOs are able to support schools like in Tana River, Ijara and all that, that is okay, but that is an interim measure. That is not sustainable. I think this is a responsibility where I would like to see that the kind of education system we prescribe and we want to follow through to be implemented is one that equips the schools to be able to uh, deliver that curriculum. You know, recently, uh, Mashogu did a merge with this thing called will not be uh, categorizing schools. What did they come, uh, how, how, how did they reach there? They said, we'll now be looking at schools as all, you know, if it is JSS, they are JSS, then senior schools and all that. But all of you know that there are schools which are less equipped, not at the same level as the national schools, which we now we do not want to recategorize. Uh, what would happen if uh, the other schools which were started by parents, which have not been equipped, have not been given the affirmative action fund or equalization fund to come to the level of this other hitherto uh, uh, classified national schools? So we require a real re, uh, integration of uh, infrastructure development, uh, teaching or provision of uh, teaching and uh, learning material, the deployment of teachers and recruitment of more and more as we speak. I think we should not be just thumping uh, the way I saw the president talking about it uh, during the, Jam the Jam Madaraka day, more like we have really recruited so many teachers, but uh, those so many uh, come only to 1.5. JSS. So that is something we require to do. And uh, on the attack that I had mentioned on schools, I said uh, currently the education is under attack. Uh, and uh, you are, uh, I think uh, this is the question that was asking us what are we doing and can we make appeal to the, uh, you're saying you're looking at two protagonists. For us, we are looking at can we have a national conversation that can heal this country? that can make sure that we repair it and the students, the teachers and all the learners feel safe wherever they are. As we speak now, you know, we are witnessing cases where even police officers are following the parents to their homes and in those homes and those houses, their children, some stayed away because of the mandamanos, but they are even being followed to their, 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 their homes. Is this sustainable? I mean, this is a recipe for serious disaster. And uh, our appeal has been there that we require peace, with, but require sobriety more and more. Because if the top leadership continues to speak like they are in a, a, a war zone, I think uh, then we are not getting to where we should we should we should be so uh, i wanted to say that uh, all of us in our own areas the parents the teachers in all the corners of this country let us continue appealing to for reason to prevail but most importantly is that let our schools remain protected zones 
let the infrastructure not be destroyed, but let our teachers and the children also be protected. Because if we do not do that, then we'll be in a deeper problem than we think. Imagine the children who are going through this, they become adults. They'll think that we are the ones who made them go through hell. They'll come for our necks. Thank you. Uh, next, Dr. Manyasa, please, a few minutes. Thank you. Very quickly to the points that have been raised. Uh, children can't afford smartphones. They can't afford smartphones and they don't need smartphones. Uh, the, the reason smartphones are being asked is we have teachers who are never prepared to implement the curriculum and cannot interpret the curriculum designs. And, 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 and for me, that is part of the problem. And actually, at some point, I thought some teachers were trying to, to get parents to speak for them against the government because the teachers' own voices had been emasculated uh, with not killed and many uh, and, and the associations dysfunctional. So I thought they were frustrating parents so parents can speak out on their behalf. I think that we need to focus on having enough teachers, making sure that we retool those teachers, and making sure that that retooling of those teachers is not a TSC function. TSC usurped that function and it had no mandate nor capacity to actually retool teachers. So that is a major problem. Without proper preparation of teachers, the implementation of the new curriculum is definitely in peril. The issue of categorization of schools, this was actually our submission to the task force. And, and I start to get the sense that some of the things they, that the government is throwing around is trying to test the waters on some of the things that could be in the task force report. We asked that we stop categorizing schools in the new context, in the sense that we expect a 100% transition from primary to junior secondary. So there will be no exit exam from primary to junior secondary. If there is no exit from primary to junior secondary, how do you place children based on the rankings of the schools? There is no mechanism for determining who will go to which school. So our idea is that, and this is what we submitted to the task force, I don't know if it will be considered, that we get all our current national extra county schools and county schools considered to be senior schools. We get all those turned into senior school. And we invest in the county schools to narrow the gap between them and the national schools. As much as possible, close that gap. Then categorize them based on the streams, because that is what is envisaged in the new curriculum, that there will be streams. There will be the arts and, 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 and sports. There will be the science, there will be the humanities. Categorize them right based on which school already has massive investment in which area. So you're not going to call a school that doesn't have a science lab a science school. You're not going to take a school that has no space even to create uh, pitches for children to play a sports and talent school. That was our suggestion. Our suggestion also was that we take this, the, there's so many tivets that have been developed recently and turn them into the technical stream of senior school. Because the technical stream of senior school will require specific tutors who cannot come from the current pool of teachers that we have now in our secondary schools because they don't have the, the, the technical skills. And they will require certain facilities, workshops that we can now not start putting up in all our senior schools but they are available in these many technical uh, institutions, in these many TVETs. So we recommended that we convert a number of those TVETs into senior schools pursuing the technical 
stream. And then we recommended that the sub-county schools, because they are all over the country, they be made junior secondary school and expanded. I had that the previous argument was that those schools don't have the space to accommodate all junior secondary. The truth is that they have. We are collecting data on secondary schools right now. We have schools that have capacity for 500 children having 120. Those schools have capacity that is underutilized. What we need is urgently to deploy teachers. What the government has done is to post interns. An intern cannot take children through junior secondary because junior secondary is very critical for this curriculum. It is the stage where children are going to figure out their paths. You cannot have intern. We need experienced teachers in that, in that, in that space. You cannot have an intern being the one to, to teach children through junior secondary. And government is lying to Kenyans when it says we have hired 30,000 teachers. They hired 25,000 interns. And the other non-intern teachers were replacements of retired teachers. So it's not telling the public the truth. And, and, and that for me is a problem. I think that if we can focus our mind and ask ourselves, where are the gaps that need urgent uh, attention and mobilize to speak to everyone who can get something done urgently in the interim to address the, the, the great mess that is junior secondary school today, but also to lay foundation for a meaningful senior secondary because senior secondary is in two years. We will be doing this country great service. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, for that candidness and openness and the factual information sharing, uh, expert information sharing. Uh, lastly, uh, but not least, uh, Dr. Kinyari. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, the, the the invitation and the questions. There are quite a number, but um, I hope to address um, the ones that were that were presented. One one thing about water harvesting, and uh, I I can really identify with the fact that most of the tanks are not covered, or even if they are covered, they are, can actually get contaminated. Maybe an animal falls in and they drown and uh, they have to, uh, the water gets contaminated. But what's more important that we never think about is the type of roof that is harvesting that water. And uh, when you think about it in the long run, I know we don't have a lot of asbestos roofs, but um, it's good to consider places that may have asbestos roofs. If you're going to do water harvesting with that kind of roof, then uh, in the long term, there's a risk of cancer, lung cancer, for the people who are taking the water, and especially if they are children in a boarding school or even children going there, it's, it's important to think about uh, the type of roof. What can be done? Again, it's just uh, ensuring that uh, we have regular monitoring of these tanks. It may be difficult to see what has gone in, but uh, to actually do some a bacteriological take a sample to the to to to, to the usually the, most of the county health departments have a places where you can do toxicology or just measure the, the, the just look at the water or invest in filters that can actually be able you know the kind of filters that you have sand and uh, pots that are easy to to make and not expensive uh, again that would be a good thing to consider then there was a question about the special needs and especially children who have autism and those ones who are different, differently, who are differently talented, and uh, this is uh, very important even for them and their care caregivers. As this is again where the ad activism from the parents and from the society should come, because I, I believe we can be able to set up regional hubs for a ch these children with special needs and get people who are trained, uh, medical personnel and social workers who are trained 
in handling, uh, in, in being able to allow these children to grow, to express themselves, come up with talents that they can be able to use uh, for, for their livelihoods. Again, this takes a lot of consensus and collaboration. And it has to go into a policy uh, in terms of uh, working with government and investing. But I believe if we had like 10 regional hubs for autism, we would have uh, enough uh, uh, facilities uh, to be able to take care of uh, uh, differently uh, abled. Then there's also the element of uh, just mental health. I think most of the time we think about uh, dyslexia or other conditions that have to do with um, uh, the, the way the brain is not working well, but you forget about the mental health, the normal stress that uh, the students uh, will go, be, be going through. And again, it's a question of removing those factors that will cause uh, the stress that the children uh, will be going through. Then there was a question on um, the toilets uh, for, for people with disability. This again, I feel, think about a ramp. You don't need the government to put a ramp. Think about the room. You could easily just break down the wall in one, one toilet and make it bigger, then put in the rails. These are some of the things that are practical that parents can be able to get the take take the power in their hands and make sure that any any facility will be disability uh, uh will, will, will will have disability access so uh, for me i feel uh, there's a lot of parents uh, we can be able to do even as we we we, we uh we have activism for the for the government but if parents are able to own the schools and are allowed in the schools i feel they can be able to do a lot but we still need the government uh, to play their part thank you Hey, Doctor, you, you are done? Yes. Ah, thank you so much. Thank yeah, you so thank much. You and much. Uh, yes. my way of wrapping up is um, the way forward. I know we've built a network of uh, interested uh, Kenyans. Ndugu Joshua, who are... there's something. Sorry, Ndugu Joshua, there's something that I think was raised uh, because it featured uh, severally by many of uh, uh, the listeners and participants on the inclusive education. And uh, I think it was coming up in uh, how do we ensure, you know, we are talking of inclusion, but the classrooms are not accessible and all that. So I, I don't want to speak more about it, but I just want us to uh, realize that this is becoming a reality now, that Kenya, like other countries, we should be moving towards an inclusive education framework. And because uh, as we say, you know, these children with disability, learners with disability, we live with them. So we live together, we learn together, and that is what would enable us to understand the various challenges that they face. Uh, this process, I, I know, maybe KISE and other institutions that are helping in developing our teachers need to up their game to ensure that even our teachers are retooled wherever they are, so that at least they are able to handle some of this. Uh, the guidelines on the infrastructure development and all that, the, this, the enforcement that uh, they be uh, inclusive or accessible classrooms and other facilities. I think those are the issues that we think must be emphasized. They are part and parcel of the standards uh, that we are actually recommending. Thank you.